All right. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Emily and I'm the marketing director for Clinkscale's Elder Law Practice in our office in Hayes. We are very excited to bring you this first session of our Spring Lunch with Randy series. Today, attorney Randy Clinkscales and benefits specialist Joy Thomas will be speaking to you about Medicaid changes. Please feel free to send any questions you may have to me in the chat box that's located at the bottom of your screen. And then at the very end of this presentation, we will address any of those questions that you may have. At this point, I will go ahead and hand it over to Randy. Well, hello everyone. I'm really happy to be joined by uh, Joy Thomas and I'll, I'm gonna introduce her in a, in a moment. I do want to uh, talk to you a little bit about uh, a couple of things first. Uh, our topic today is written and unwritten rules uh, of, of Medicaid. Uh, and Joy is gonna really be talking about that. Before we get started, I would like to ask a question and I've got a slide here in a couple of minutes is, uh, when, when do you start talking about uh, Medicaid uh, with a family that you're working with. Uh, and so if you would use the chat box down at the bottom uh, and, and write in your replies uh, very briefly, just a couple words uh, if you can, and then we'll ask Emily to read some of those replies there. Uh, uh, so as you're doing that, I wanna remind you of some upcoming events uh, we have uh, uh, our next lunch with Randy is on April uh, 14th, uh, understanding and uh, completing uh, essential documents. We're going to be joined by Jill Wexler of our office. And then on uh, May 19th, we're going to talk about uh, some of the COVID update rules with uh, Jenny Walters and um, um, I think maybe JJ, I don't remember who, is with uh, her, are you on that with the Joy? I don't remember. No, uh, I'm not. Okay, anyway, uh, Jenny Walters from our office will be leading that. I uh, also have some upcoming uh, webinars uh, for uh, the public, if you will, but you're welcome to join it. Uh, one is uh, if the diagnosis is dementia and that's on uh, April uh, 13th, uh, two sessions. Uh, and then on April 28th, we have um, uh, the eight things you need to know for the second half of life. And finally, on um, uh, April 29th, we, had a, have the, we have one on how to pay for long-term care. I think we also have one coming up uh, that we're doing with the Alzheimer's Association on April 6th, uh, a presentation so you might, you might watch for that. Um, we've done that presentation with the Alzheimer's Association on a, a couple of occasions. And finally, uh, we have our, uh, we're excited that we're gonna try to do our uh, geriatric symposium uh, in Hayes uh, live on October 22nd uh, from eight to four. Uh, we're still working on our speakers and we'll uh, have some uh, more information about that, but that, that will actually be for, uh, for CEUs. S so uh, this is Joy Thomas uh, with me. Uh, Joy's been with me about uh, 16 years now, Joy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think just this weekend was 16 years. So mm -hmm. um, one of the, the, the best thing, if you're a, if you run an organization, one of the best things you can do is hire people that are smarter than you are, uh, and you'll have a much better organization. And, and Joy is one of those folks that I hired that I know is smarter than me, but uh, th th that's okay, I'm better looking. Uh, I'm kidding, Joy. Uh, but uh, Joy really gets into uh, the weeds on our, our Medicaid side, our benefits side, um, um, Joy, um, when we started this, was probably spending a couple hours a day uh, on on Medicaid and doing a bunch of other paralegal stuff, and and now uh, she uh, heads up our benefits team and 
uh, does that, you know, full time. And we also have one other person that does it full time. And um, Joy, I looked the other day and it looks like you've got about 60 or 70 active cases right now. Does that sound right? Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, so when, when do you start uh, considering Medicaid? Um, and uh, Emily, I don't know, have, have there been any responses? Yes, there have been quite a few. Um, some of them talk about it after asking about resources, start talking about it during admission inquiry meetings. Sometimes it comes up as soon as they begin contact with any client um, due to um, working with them that way. Um, sometimes it's brought up in crisis management situations. And those are some of the answers that we got. Okay. And, and so the answer, you know, may be somewhat different uh, based on if it's a single person or a married couple. Uh, but I, I, you know, for us, it's any time with a single person, it's any time that we're, we're seeing signs of chronic illnesses. Um, also signs of weird family dynamics. Uh, if there's any kind of resource con concern, uh, then we're gonna be uh, wanting to start talking about, about Medicaid. Uh, with a married couple, again, resource concerns, but family dynamics, uh, uh, signs of chronic illness, uh, th then we're, we're actually gonna start uh, that far back. So why start so early? Because um, families do crazy things. Uh, what I see sometimes, uh, you know, grandma's uh, uh, going into a nursing home, so we need to get all the accounts out of her name. Or, uh, and you could get, kind of go on with a, a whole laundry list of things that, that they start doing for mom or for grandma or whatever. Uh, they start gifting stuff away. Uh, honestly, the earlier we can get involved from our standpoint, if there have been some problems, then we have a much better uh, opportunity to fix those problems, to get them. There's something called curing. We can cure a lot of problems uh, if, we're, if we've got, still got some resources available to make that happen. So as an example, Sometimes someone may have given away some money uh, and um, uh, it is gone, but there may be other money that would allow us through a technique called a, a, a special type of annuity to, to cure, that, cure that penalty. The other thing that you know, we get concerned about is, again, the inappropriate planning uh, we're looking for, did they have inappropriate financial tools, uh, you know, ran into someone the other day that, you know, was elderly and bought a, a, an annuity that doesn't mature for 20 years. Uh, not only does that cause a problem with the annuity, that, that could really cause a problem with Medicaid uh, because it's not, uh, well, a whole bunch of reasons that that, that annuity would be a problem. Um, really, you know, want, want to recognize there's a need for essential documents. Uh, so if we have a single person, we really want to get in a position where we can start the planning process and having really good essential documents in place. So if that person's health deteriorates uh, to the point that they cannot make decisions, we've got a decision maker uh, uh, involved. And generally, as a, as a, a rule in our office, uh, and, and this is, we've tested this over and over again, the less time that we have in a, in a case, in, in, in other words, the less time that we have to get on Medicaid, the more expensive that case is going to be uh, because we really have to marshal a lot of resources uh, to make that happen. Uh, we, particularly with a single person, we run around, um, we, we run into difficulty finding documents. Uh, we have an acronym we use in our office, uh, GAC, is go around clients. So the earlier we can get involved and realize that we have to go 
around the client, uh, the, the better off we are. Uh, because we, you know, and again, a lot of you have experienced that, but, you know, recognizing early on that you have a client that's not going to be, or, or a patient that cannot or will not, or is unable to be helpful uh, is really important to, to start that process uh, early on. The other thing is that we may be able to discover uh, and access other, other payment resources. So uh, there, it, I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. With a married couple, again, crazy families. I, you know, I, I think I've just had the last two or three weeks a lot of crazy families. So that, that keeps floating to the top. Uh, uh, good intention, good intentions, but uh, doing crazy things that uh, can really jeopardize uh, mom or dad uh, getting on Medicaid and causing them to be disqualified uh, or making it completely impossible. I, you know, I had one the other day where, uh, uh, you know, they had given away so many resources uh, and then the resources got tied up. Uh, with uh, some bank lending uh, on those resources and we couldn't get them back. Uh, that, that, that really, uh, you know, they're really in a jam right now. Um, so if we'd been involved early on, there was a real easy way to get around that without having that type of uh, penalty uh, or potential for penalty. And uh, unfortunately, the way they did it, if they were to apply now, they would be disqualified for 80 months. And so, you know, you know, really have to get them stopped. Um, with a married couple, you know, one thing that's real important is, is getting involved early enough that you can start finding documents. Uh, you know, every household uh, has their own filing system, which many times is, you know, throwing things in a box, but, you know, even finding the box may be tricky. Um, stopping them from doing disqualifying acts. Again, unintentionally, um, you know, we had one a couple of years ago where I don't know, 10 or $20,000 they, they paid for their daughter's, granddaughter's wedding. Uh, and so, you know, we had to work around that. And luckily we were, we were involved early enough in the process that we had resources so that we could work around that person. And so they would not be, uh, be a non-paying resident at a, at a facility. The other thing that we want to do, uh, honestly, with a uh, married couple is look at what are our tools that we can uh, use right now, such as uh, paying debts. Um, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment why that's a big deal, uh, shifting resources around to the well spouse so that debts can be serviced, um, maximizing their community spouse resource allowance, uh, and then again, tapping into other benefits. Um, some of the things that we would like to look at uh, so that we, again, you know, my, contrary to what some may think our goal many times is if we can avoid Medicaid, that's what we would like to do. Uh, and, and Medicaid needs to be the last stop on the, in the planning process. And so many times we can look at alternatives such as life insurance settlement. I've talked about that before where you can sell a life insurance policy and have a tax-free exchange if you use that money for long-term care costs. Um, uh, if we're, you know, years before long-term care, uh, purchasing um, hybrid long-term care policies that provide for life care, I'm sorry, uh, hybrid life insurance policies that provide for long-term care and tap into those. Um, selling designated property to pay for care property that the family may not want, but they don't want necessarily to go on, on Medicaid. Uh, setting up irrevocable trust. Uh, seems like lately we've, we've kind of running into a lot of being able to tap into 
pension and VA compensation. We're running into, I mean, I just had one yesterday where um, we're going to work with him. He, he is, we're getting a lot of Vietnam veterans right now. Uh, and so and we're getting a lot of Agent Orange cases. And so the gentleman yesterday has both diabetes and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma related to uh, uh, VA, uh, to his time in Vietnam. With those combined with some other stuff, we can keep him off of Medicaid. Uh, so, you know, they thought they were going to have to go on Medicaid, but we, you know, move some stuff around. So I don't think he'll have to go on Medicaid. Um, tapping into to Medicare properly and skilled care. I mean, just share, a, you know, we, we run into people that have not signed up for B as an example, or not signed up for D as an example, uh, and trying to get them enrolled uh, before we have uh, catastrophic, catastrophic uh, medical bills. Um, I will share with you, uh, yesterday I got, I had shoulder surgery, what Joy, about eight weeks ago or so, and I got a thing from uh, my insurance company that my total bill was $29,000 and my out-of-pocket was about $500 uh, between Medicare and the supplemental insurance. But again, educating people uh, how important that is and, and getting that uh, in place. And then finally for us, a big one is uh, helping families try to stay in the least restrictive environment until they really do, do need some type of care uh, out that cannot be provided in the home. Just a couple of red flags here uh, when we're looking at preparing for Medicaid. Uh, personal services contracts uh, is always a big deal where they've been paying a kid to, to help them and there's no contract in place. And sometimes that can run into a lot of money uh, that they've paid a kid over several years. Uh, the other one, uh, enjoy any of these, if you want to jump in on that's fine, but uh, whether it's been uh, a child on their checking account and there's a lot of checks for cash, that's that's been red flagged. Um, a, a check to the kid, it doesn't say what it's for. Uh, and it, it, you know, then then we're having to, to justify a whole bunch of stuff. And if you're justifying a whole bunch of stuff, you're spending a lot of time, if not money, uh, trying to, to make, that, make that work out. I had a case years and years ago, Joy and I did, uh, years and years ago, where actually a doctor uh, drove from Iowa, took a train from Iowa to uh, Garden City area, the Dodge City, rented a car, and took care of his dad and, and did a bunch of stuff like that. And he, he would come out four or five times a year Eventually, his dad ran low on money. We applied for Medicaid, and uh, his dad had reimbursed his son for the train fare, and Medicaid uh, caused his dad to be disqualified for uh, Medicaid because his son, uh, because he had reimbursed his son, and they consider that a, a personal services and not um, uh, did not have a contract. Even though we had a promise for, even though we had a power of attorney that said he could do that and he could be reimbursed for that. The other one I want to make you aware of because we run into this really accidentally. So a farmer sells his farm to a neighbor, and the the farmer is 80 years old, uh, and he sells his contract his farm on contract for 15 years, which is a reasonable contract. Uh, but for Medicaid purposes, that's not going to work because that's not actuarially sound uh, for Medicaid purposes. So even though in the business world, that's a valid contract uh, in a reasonable contract, in, in Medicaid, that's not. Uh, and, and so um, uh, we you know have to be careful about those. We've actually had to renegotiate some of those contracts and try to get them into an actuarially sound uh, contract. Used to be, and sorry. And 
most of that is based on the social security tables when yep. we're talking about it being actuarially sound. Yep. And so if the contract, if you look on the social security table and it says that this person, this 80 year old person has a lifespan of 7.5 years, that contract cannot be any longer than that 7.5 years. Uh, again, we used to be able, and we've talked about this before, used to be able to sell land for 80% of value. Uh, somewhere along the line, this is one of these unwritten rules, they, they really changed that. Um, and so uh, we, we have to, again, uh, we, we had a case, was it last year, Joy, year before last, where luckily we had kept the emails uh, from uh, the uh, Medicaid, uh, CanCare, whoever it was, uh, saying we could sell it for 80% of value. So we were able to, to um, uh, get our clients out of that jam, but they had sold it for 80% of value. So Joy, let's, I wanna now turn it over to you and again, uh, uh, Joy is uh, uh, in the weeds all the time with Medicaid. And so Joy, let's just talk a little bit about um, uh, some of the changes you saw in 2020. And you, you don't have to read them word for word, but just kind of hit them highlights. Hit the highlights. Yeah, so a big change was the processing of Medicaid applications. We had a contractor that was doing those for the state. And um, because of various issues, especially with delays in processing, um, KDHE took back over processing of the long-term care, adult medical, the elderly and disabled, um, and some other programs to try to speed up that process to bring some more seasoned workers into that. And so that actually has helped quite a bit. Um, they've also taken over responsibility for some of the appeals when it comes to long-term care. Uh, they've updated the manual that they usually rely on for uh, making decisions as to eligibility and otherwise. Uh, it was the key some before. There are now two of them. One of them is for elderly and disabled, which is the medical key some, um, and, and the other is for family and children. There's also been uh, issues with a community spouse post eligibility of the institutionalized spouse giving or selling resources and the effect that that has on the Medicaid spouse. Before we didn't have to worry about that. Now we have to be, we have to caution families um, about that and the potential problems with it. There's inconsistency from what I've seen so far in how that's treated. So um, to be safe, we're really uh, recommending that the well spouse um, not give away property um, without talking to an uh, attorney first. Um, and we've it, had, let, me, let me interrupt there just a little bit because I, I will tell you that uh, on that issue, I, I belong to a listserv with other attorneys across the state that do uh, uh, elder law uh, or, or at least do Medicaid. And, and boy, this is a topic that you know, we're just seeing uh, really inconsistent uh, cases, and and unfortunately, if you're wrong, then you're going to be in an appeal uh, for a long, long time. Uh, and uh, you know, we've uh, just want to be careful about. It. I, I, you know, I, I just wish I could tell a client this is the rule, but I can't tell a client that. Um, I, I can tell the client what the risks are. Right. Yeah. Um. We had some issues with staff not being fully trained. Um, a lot of improvements came with that, with KDAG taking on some processing, but we've had a change in contractors again um, over the CanCare Clearinghouse. And so they've pulled in a lot of the people from um, that were working there prior, but they also had to go through the hiring process. So we've got a lot of new people being trained and some seasoned ones still coming on to process applications. So we've seen some inconsistencies more here lately, um, but been able to work through those. So just caution you on that. 
Um, we did see this last year an increase in the protected income limit for home and community based services waiver programs, which is huge because it was 700 and like $747 a month and jumped up to 1157 and that's been a big help, especially when we've got a married uh, couple. Um, their, their appeals and grievance departments um, ended up being separated uh, for various reasons. And so there's just some different hoops we have to go through now. So we've yeah, also, right oh, good. We, um, for 2021, um, generally these changes are made in January. There are also some changes that are made in July. So those are the two months to really be paying attention to changes with Medicaid. Um, but so I can tell you with the Medicare Part D subsidy, this is what the state will pay towards the monthly premium for especially um, the HCBS and LTC programs just jumped up slightly um, to $31.73 a month. Uh, the substantial home equity limit has moved up to $603,000. Uh, excess shelter deduction, this comes into play when you've got a community spouse that actually needs more income based on their um, taxes and insurance they're paying on a home, or perhaps they're in assisted living or paying rent. And so that deduction also uh, increased, uh, which is helpful. And then we had our community spouse resource allowances. Uh, the amount of countable resources that the well spouse can have in their name at the time um, that the uh, other spouse is qualifying for Medicaid. And those have both gone up as well. The minimum is now 26,076 and the maximums jumped up to 130,380. So that as well is very helpful. And Joy, I know you were very happy when they increased that substantial home equity limit. I know you were kind of sweating that with your home. So, it's a, yeah, I, you know, Not usually an issue. <laughs> yeah, obviously, that's not, that's really not an issue. Uh, I, we've never had that as an issue in any case. I, I do want to talk a little bit about the, the last item here. Uh, and again, somewhat related, but you know, had a family come in the other day and uh, kind of go back to our initial question. Um, you know, in a in a course of a year, um, they had spent seventy five thousand uh, dollars in a in a facility. When if they uh, and when they came in, they were, were down to about twenty thousand uh, dollars. As a married couple and. And actually, the very li limit, the, the very least they should have gotten was fifty thousand dollars. But they, because they didn't take appropriate action, and, and in fact, there was a way she she would have been able to keep all of that money. Uh, and understand, she's in her eighties, and so this is the remaining money that she has for the rest of her lifetime. And so our 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 fighting for uh, uh, keeping the, you know, filling up that community spouse resource allowance and protecting other resources for the well spouse is really, really critical in our office. And so we really, that's really kind of an important item uh, for us. Uh, okay, Joe, I'm going to go on the next slide here. Yeah, so just some changes, um, temporary, I'm sure with uh, the public health emergency over this last year with COVID-19. A few of the things that we've seen change is that we're not receiving any annual review forms for our long-term care cases. Uh, those usually come out once a year. And at this point, they're pushing those out for three or four months, or in some cases, pushing them out for a year. So we've got some people that haven't actually had their case reviewed for um, eligibility for two years, almost two years now. Um, and so that's taken some stress off families, but we do recommend that if anything's changed as far as income or expenses, that that be submitted to CanCure because they are updating patient liabilities and community spouse um, income allowances. And so we wanna stay on top of that, even though there's not a formal review from year to year right now, um, we wanna make sure that we keep the state updated. 
Another thing that has been helpful is payment of family caregivers under the HCBS mm -hmm. waiver programs. Um, being able to have someone in your home that's there regularly during COVID has been huge and to be able to be paid for that instead of bringing outside parties in and risking uh, potential infection and so forth has been very important to a lot of families. So very grateful for those provisions. Uh, there has been a delay in eligibility ending for a lot of people that have issues with excess resources right now. We do still continue to report any changes in resources, whether it's selling um, property or inheritance and that kind of thing. We wanna make sure the state knows that there's those additional resources right now, um, but the state is not um, ending eligibility because of excess resources at this point. We um, expect that that probably will be happening soon, but there will be a time frame. I'm not sure yet if it's going to be like 30 or 60 days for that for families to remedy that, but need to keep that in mind. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be interesting to watch post COVID world. Uh, and because that policy of payment to family caregivers is, is really a great policy. So many of our clients are in areas that there just are not services. And being able to do that has been great. I, I Just a couple things. It, it, again, I think Emily may have mentioned, but if you have a question, uh, type it in the chat box down below. And then at the end, we'll uh, try to get to those. Uh, and then the other thing, I, I, uh, I just now noticed that cute little graphic that uh, um, actually put in there. <laughs> so, all right, so let's go to the next one, uh, Joy. Okay, so just some issues in general that we run up against um, and continue to with the HCBS waiver programs, uh, trying to figure out for a married couple when does it when does the state look at um, their total resources to determine the community spouse resource allowance and there's you know we don't in some situations we don't know if that they're going to look at the month when a care assessment was completed or when the assigned managed care organization uh, gets their assessment completed um, there's still some inconsistencies in that um, so we we really have to work with the families on how long they should continue to privately pay uh, for care so they don't get too far behind. Enjoy. Uh, let's, let's, uh, I want to jump down to a related slide. Sure. Uh, the, the community spouse income allowance not being yes. allowed for months of eligibility prior to the month. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, so that's another really important thing. When you have a couple, you really want to try to get a Medicaid application submitted as soon as you know that the spin down has been completed. Um, if you wait and you submit the app and ask for prior months, um, there's not going to be a community spouse income allowance designated. They are not going to start that until the application is in. So if we've got a couple that's spent down in January, but we don't submit the app until March, um, there's not going to be that designation of income from the Medicaid spouse to the community spouse uh, and, until starting with March. Uh, so need to be really care keep that in mind. We try to get everything together that we could possibly think that CanCare is going to want so that there's not a delay in processing. But at the same time, you have sometimes you have to go ahead and submit that app and try to get the rest of what you need later just to protect that income allowance. Enjoy really what I the what jumped out at me uh, in conversation with you and Jenny is that 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 uh, income allowance uh for hcbs is not going to be retroactive right uh, yes. until even though you file the application until it's approved um you know to me they they're they're just making hcbs so tricky from mm -hmm. a trying to help the family standpoint maybe yes. you've got a different opinion but 
I know Jenny just throws rocks at me when I talk about HCBS sometimes. So. <laughs> well, and that's one other thing to keep in mind right now. Um, last that we were told, if you have somebody that's not um, old enough to be on the frail elderly waiver for HCBS, and they're younger, um, the physical disability waiver program right now has like a seven year wait list to get services. So um, that's something to keep in mind, but I mean, it's sad because we've had some families that are now having to put loved ones in long-term care just to be able to pay for care. So anyway. And, Joy, let's drop down to, uh, let, let me, you know, we've, we've run into a couple of issues about uh, APS, financial uh, fiduciary abuse, um, uh, triggered by the Medicaid application. But I want to talk to, about the the uh, uh, spousal elective share deadline on the third one down. Right. So most of the time when we have a well spouse die before um, a Medicaid spouse, <clears throat> we have to make sure that the Medicaid spouse receives their spousal elective share of the estate of the deceased spouse. Um, and there's two deadlines, really. There's one of notifying King Care that the Medicaid recipient intends to file a claim, submit a claim for their share. But then there's another deadline when they actually have to provide proof that they got their spousal elective share. And there's supposed to be notices going out to the Medicaid recipient of these deadlines. And that very seldom happens. In our, our cases, they might get the, a notice for the first deadline. Um, so it's, it's a rule to keep in mind. Um, and we try to be very careful to get those deadlines on the calendar as soon as we know that there's gonna be a situation like this. Um, Joy, let's, I'm gonna go on to the next slide. Um, but I, I do know we really struggle with, you know, that that spousal elective share and, you know, how, how do you pay for it? And uh, because that, that's a process, I will tell you from our standpoint, uh, what we have done is we basically do uh, a spousal, spousal elective share form and then submit that to the state and said that, you know, this is what, if we did a probate, this is what would happen. Right, and, right. And so far, we've been, we've been okay on that. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, you're gonna you know, dump a whole bunch of money into some type of probate proceeding, which is really unfortunate that CanCare has taken uh, this, this rule here and kind of gone to town with it. Yeah. So, so again, the idea is they want the ill spouse in the facility to get their spousal elective share. And if you don't do that, then they consider the failure to do so basically the equivalent of a gift and right. will disqualify you for the value of that elective share that you did not elect a gift. Yeah. It's pretty technical, but it's, it's a big deal. So. Mm -hmm. Um, Joy, let's go to the next one. Um, <laughs> you, you've danced with this first one a, a whole bunch of times. And, uh, and again, so I, I just want to give you an example of one that's coming to mind where uh, a mom went into the nursing home. Um, uh, there were some penalty issues and then dad goes into the nursing home. And then we're trying to figure out uh, the, how the penalties would look. So Joy, take it from there. Yeah, <laughs> I'm probably not gonna get this exactly right, but an issue with, you know, now they're dividing this penalty period between two spouses, but they're gonna start them at different times. And, um, and I think in one case, they actually, it wasn't divided equally. Um, and it really messed with, with um, coverage for the, at the facilities. And um, yeah, it, it was just chaos. And we ended up going through an appeal and, and getting that cleaned up. But um, 
Glad that doesn't happen too often. And well, and you had one where that was going on, and then one of them died. Right, right. And then they tried to plot to add it to the other spouses after they'd already divided yes, it. Yes. And yeah, yeah. So yeah. Yeah. It got way over really, my head. <laughs> really have to nail them down on showing you proof of of do, why they can do that. And um, just like today, when I, a phone call I got, you know, I got inconsistent numbers. I was told about a situation where ownership of an account um, was in place for a Medicaid applicant that the family wasn't aware of. A daughter had added mom's name to a couple accounts. And one caseworker's telling us that one third of that account is considered to be the Medicaid applicant's. And then today I'm told by another one, no, it's 100% when it comes to counting values. Um, and when I've asked for the rep, the Keesum reference, um, was told by supervi the supervisor that it's not clear, but this is what they're doing right now. So the unwritten rules. So I, and I, I want to jump on number two again. I want to reemphasize that. So my client is eligible for for Medicaid today. Uh, I have three months to get that application on file, but understand that three months, even though we're, we'll relate back, we're not going to end up with a community spouse income allowance. Right, not until the month of application. Right, and so you could end up with a really, really upset uh, resident uh, that because you delayed, uh, they're not going to get their income allowance uh, because of the delay. So even though they say it's, it's retroactive, it's, it's only retroactive for certain purposes. So, um, uh, Joy, let's talk about the last one, because I think this okay. is real important. Um, yeah, this has really come up in the last year and a half. Uh, it used to be that you could do a deed um, a, for a firm, both spouses to just the community spouse and um, to get ownership changed, to get income, that income stream, if it's income producing property over to the wealth spouse. And but then what we ran into was a change in the rule that if you don't make that transfer in ownership, in the month prior to the first month that Medicaid eligibility is needed, then they'll recognize that the ownership has changed, but any income as a result of that property is still going to get split, divided between the two spouses, which is going to increase the patient liability of the Medicaid recipient and decrease the amount of income that the well spouse um, would normally be entitled to, would, and that becomes a problem, especially with our farming families and others that have businesses, I think, when they're trying to budget, um, knowing that half of that income is gonna end up going to um, the Medicaid spouse. So well, just and, have to- let's make, it, let's make it worse. Uh, if there's debt, they're not gonna let us subtract the debt um, the, the, the principal payment from mm -hmm. the nursing home resident's income, and it all has to be deducted from the well spouse's income. So mm -hmm. it basically wipes out her income uh, because art or it goes into for, foreclosure. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it, 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 it's critical, it, this is really critical if you've got somebody that's got a bunch of debt on property uh, that we get that shifted over so that the, the well spouse can continue to service the debt. Otherwise, there's not going to be, they're not, gonna, they're not going to get credit for the principal payment, only for the interest. Is that correct, Joy? Yeah. Okay. So as, as they say, that, that situation sucks. So, um, other one here, Joy, I want to uh, touch on is that a lot of a lot of folks don't understand and appreciate that uh, on estate recovery, uh, there's actually can be a credit against the estate recovery for payment of long-term uh, care insurance. And 
I spent 30 minutes on the phone yesterday. Um, and so this is, uh, we had a, a client that was on uh, Medicaid. Uh, she died uh, year, several years later, husband died. Uh, Medicaid makes a claim 80, not 80 or 90 thousand dollars against his estate for for uh, estate recovery, and luckily a bunch of her long-term care was paid by uh, long-term care insurance, and so we were able to go back and and we're able to reduce the the size of that lien. But CanCare doesn't keep up with that, so I was on the phone yesterday with the insurance company. Uh, and, and, you know, they're trying to dig out premium hit, uh, payment history for, for several, several years. Um, yeah. and the again, other issue too, I want to point out on this that we run into is that a lot of people don't understand that somebody that has a Medicaid patient liability to facility has to pay their long-term care insurance proceeds on top of that patient liability. And so what happens is then is that the facility has to reduce its claim that it submits to the state by the amount of the long-term care insurance proceeds received. Um, we try to encourage families to get those long-term care insurance payments paid directly to the facility um, versus making two different payments uh, to the facility each month. Um, but again, that's not something that the state's paying attention to. So. Um, lots of times families sit on those long-term care insurance proceeds and, and don't get them paid yes. to the facility like they should. Yeah, yeah. And then we have awkward conversations. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, touch, we touched a little bit on um, um, uh, the, let me go back here, um, principal payments. We've talked about that already, uh, why that can create a real problem with uh, patient obligation. Um, uh, HCBS uh, in annuities and promissory notes is problematic. And the, how this comes up a lot of times is that someone's trying to apply for HCBS. There may have been some inappropriate transfers that we could ordinarily cure with uh, annuities or promissory notes, but they're much more difficult to calculate in the HCBS area because you never know when HCBS is going to kick in because it's not retroactive. Right. Am I saying that correctly, Joy? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. And so you can't figure out the, the penalties become much more difficult to, to calculate and get around because you don't know what the effective date is. Um, Joy, you'll talk, we'll kind of wrap, wrap this up here. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, we've been dealing a, a lot with, you know, irrevocable trusts and um, agreements related to those, you know, the timing of, you know, has the, fu the funding of those trusts been more than five years so that we don't have um, giving issues there. Uh, we have to keep in mind that when even when somebody has put property into an irrevocable trust and it's been more than five years, um, they are if there's income uh, from the property in that trust, can't, Medicaid's going to count that as income and in calculating their patient liability. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not like they don't that you know they don't have to report it or anything. They actually do. They've got we've got a report that there's an irrevocable trust. This is the property that's in it. This is the income from that. And um, the CanCare has might ask for a lot of documentation, but they also have ways of finding out a lot of information on their own. And so it doesn't do any good to not give them those things up front um, and be upfront about the income from it. Yeah, and, and I, I I would just kind of underline the inconsistent decisions on appeal. Make, makes it uh, interesting uh, trying to advise clients. Um, yeah. let, let me, uh, Joy, I don't mean to skip over here, but I want to give time. For no, you're good. Uh, so, uh, Emily, if you want to, uh, I don't know if there's any questions at all. Yes, there is one right here. Let me find it. 
does it still matter if the family caregiver is a durable power of attorney or is that still a no, no? No, that's okay. My frustration that I ran into with the doctor case is that the power of attorney uh, provided that the father could reimburse his son for expenses and pay him for his services. And to me, that should have been good enough to be a personal services contract. But the lesson that I took from that was that the power of attorney agent uh, really needed a separate uh, personal property contract. I think the state was wrong. I think if I would have appealed it, we would have won. Uh, but the doctor, you know, he just, he didn't want to waste any more time on it. But um, so no, there's nothing wrong with the, that I'm aware of, of the power of attorney uh, also being a, a caregiver. In fact, I don't, that's not unusual. Right. Yeah, it's very common. Yeah. A, a paid caregiver. Let me, let me clarify that. Yeah. Okay. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions at this time, but I would invite everyone to please take the time and type those in the chat box if you do have any questions um, so we can go ahead and, and work on closing here. As Randy mentioned earlier, and like he has on the screen, um, we do have two additional Lunch with Randy sessions coming up where we'll chat about essential documents and a COVID-19 update with more members of our office. Also on there, we do have our webinar series that's coming up that is located on our website to register for. Those are all free as well. And then we do have that geriatric symposium in October that we are hoping to host live here in Hayes um, if all things go well. Otherwise, it will still be virtual like last year. Um, so we are so excited to bring it back to you and hopefully meet everyone in person and do all that networking and fun stuff. So please check out our website at clinkscaleslaw.com backslash events to register for any of these upcoming events or message or call our office for more information. Lastly, there were a few questions on if you would receive this presentation, um, but you'll receive a follow-up email from us at Clink Scales that has information regarding the next two sessions, as well as a link to this recorded session so you can go back and rewatch or share it with others. Um, so you won't receive the actual slides, but you will receive this full video so you can go back and rewatch and pause and take notes, that kind of thing. So hopefully that's helpful to you. So please do let us know if you have any further questions. Um, okay, here's one right here. In a state recovery, are there any home values that won't be pursued, like valued under $50,000? Is that a question? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know of any, I, I mean, I I know we have one where the home is valued less than $50,000 and they are pursuing it. Uh, we got around it because there was a disabled child that we were able to move the home to that avoided the estate recovery. I'm not aware of any numbers involved at all. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you for addressing that question. Um, it looks like that was the last one. So if you have any further questions, if they come to you when you watch the recorded sessions or they just come to you later tonight, please feel free to message us, ask those questions. Um, Joy and Randy will be super happy to answer any of those questions that you do may have. Um, other than that, we hope to see you coming up here in April at our next session. Um, please let us know if you have any questions. And with that, I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Randy. Bye -bye. Thank you.